All right, thank you guys so much, Family Church, for joining us today. Just, I want to give you a, just a little bit of information before we jump straight into the message today. Uh, we are taking a pause on the book of Mark. We've been going through the book of Mark for about 25 weeks now. We're taking a pause on the book of Mark uh, for six weeks. And we do this every year during the fall time because we really want to couple well with the community ministry at Family Church, what we call life groups. And life groups is going through a series on on one anothering. How do we love one another well? And so for the next six weeks, we're going to pause the book of Mark. We'll come back to it on the other side of those six weeks. But we really wanted to lean in and, and focus on this idea of one anothering, one anothering, which is really the art of loving one another. So I just wanted to give you that information before we jump into the sermon. Be back in a moment. In the 13th century, German King Frederick II conducted an awful experiment on children. What he wanted to prove was that if a child was to grow up never having been taught language, that they would naturally speak German because Germans were the superior race. That was his postulation. And so what he did for this experiment is he took children out of the care of their mothers and fathers and placed them into the care of nurses who had two rules. Number one, Never speak to the child. Don't even speak in their presence. And number two, as much as possible, don't touch the child. So these children, these babies, these infants were fed, changed, and clothed. But beyond that, they were never spoken to and they were never touched beyond what was necessary. And they actually had to stop the experiment before the whole thing came to fruition because none of the children grew up to speak any language. They all died. Because the king had effectively removed every avenue of them receiving love. There was no tenderness spoken over them. There was no words of adoration. There was no cuddling of these little ones or, or kissing or swaddling. They were cared for, all of their physical needs, that is. But they lacked one thing, and it ultimately ended in their death. They lacked love. They were created to experience the love of their creators, their mothers and fathers who would adore them and cherish them and provide for them and cuddle them. And all of that was removed to immense detriment. Love is a universal human need. It's a universal human need. We need it to survive and to thrive. All of these children died of failure to thrive because love had been removed from them. Today, we're beginning a, a new series called One Anothering. And one anothering is a term you probably haven't heard before or not very often, at least. It's the art of loving one another in the church. And the church is intended by God to be a beacon of hope and love to the world. But far too often, we're just like those little children who don't experience love from each other or even sometimes from God. And how can we ever be the, the beacon of hope and love to the world that we're intended to be if we're not experiencing the love of God? And so we're going to be jumping into 1 John, looking at the love of God. And a little bit of context about 1 John. John was one of Jesus' disciples. In fact, he called him the, himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. He knew what it was like to experience the love of the God of the universe. And in 1 John chapter 4, he unpacks for us God's love for us and how that should extend out into our relationships. And my hope for us during this series, as we kick it off this week and over the next six weeks, is that we would grow in our experience of God's love and therefore also grow in how we extend it to our brothers and sisters in Christ that are right around us right now. And so uh, 1 John chapter 4, John wrote this to believers, most likely in Asia Minor, this modern day Turkey, who were experiencing some false teachers coming into the church. And he wants the believers to be crystal clear about who God is. And so 1 John chapter 4, he begins with, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. He begins with the word Beloved. He wants us to know our, our, our identity in God is one who is loved. A disciple is not primarily somebody who does a bunch of stuff for God. A disciple is primarily someone who increasingly experiences the love of God. And here John says, you are beloved. And Pastor Craig pointed out to me yesterday that that actually says, be loved. We are intended to experience God's love. You are the beloved if you are in Christ. Are you experiencing that? And then he goes on to the commands. There's going to be several commands in this passage. And so, but 
He begins with our identity. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. That verse is, uh, you know, slapped on bumper stickers and sweatshirts and cell phone cases and coffee mugs. And it is the essence of who God is. It's not the only truth about God, but here John wants us to land on this firm foundation that our God is, is love. Not that he just has love or he has emotional feelings towards you. He is love. That is that he is the definition of love. He is the source of love. He is love. Verse nine, and this is love. And this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world. That word manifest means to be made physically apparent in front of us. And John says, if you ever doubt the love of God, Look at how he physically manifested it in the person and work of Jesus. Look at, look to the son that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him, that we might inherit eternal life through Jesus and Jesus alone. And this is love, not that we have loved God. He says, I'm going to define love for you. I want you to know what it really looks like. And it don't look to yourself. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation is a $10 word that simply means to absorb the wrath of God. And why does God's wrath need to be absorbed? Because you and I have got a big problem apart from Jesus. It's called sin. You know, in church, we talk about enemies a lot. And often that's a conversation about Satan. And Satan is a great enemy. He's a real jerk. But we have an even bigger enemy than Satan. It's called sin. And the reason it's your biggest problem is because sin is the only thing that separates you from the love of God. And here he says, we can know God's love because Jesus went to the cross, taking your sin upon himself, everything you've done, everything you will do, everything you've done today, everything that's in your past, present, future, all of it, Jesus took upon himself willingly And he died absorbing the wrath of God, propitiating the wrath of God. He took the wrath of God. And when people talk about God's wrath, it's often like, man, God's really angry. It's like he's big peeved or he's big mad. But God's wrath, that idea gets at the source or the reality, the nature of who God is, that God is holy. And so when we talk about God's wrath, it's his holy, righteous, and just anger towards sin. A holy God must punish sin. And he can do that in one of two ways. He can punish you by eternal separation from him. That's what we've earned because we're sinners. Or he punished Jesus. And as we place our faith in Jesus, Jesus takes the punishment for us. He is the propitiation for our sins. He absorbs the wrath of God that we rightly deserve, dealing with our biggest enemy, sin. And then verse 11, he says, beloved again. He's like, in case you forgot from three verses ago, you're loved whether you like it or not. Deal with it, buddy. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And we're going to see this nuanced all the way through this passage intertwined everywhere. John is trying to get us to see the love we've experienced from God should extend into our horizontal relationships. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. He reminds us of our identity again. Again, a disciple is somebody who is primarily defined by God's love for them. And then he, verse 12, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Now, if you know any Bible stories, that should probably like make you scratch your head that last verse. What are you talking about, John, that no one has ever seen God? Like we were on the love train. I was with you, man. And then we just got derailed because, well, the scripture tells us people have seen God. Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. Uh, uh, Moses saw the glory of God on the mountain. The, Peter, James, and John saw Jesus in his full glory at the transfiguration. Droves of people saw Jesus, who is God, when he was on the earth. So what are you talking about? No one has ever seen God. And scholars have got a wide array of opinions on this. Uh, but the one that I think makes most sense as I was studying is what John is referencing here in this 
in this passage that's very relational and love focused is that no one has ever seen the Trinitarian glorious relational love between the Father, Son, and Spirit in its full unadulterated form, in its full beauty and weight and glory. Nobody's ever seen that. They've seen Jesus. They've seen the effects of the Holy Spirit. They've seen the Holy Spirit descend on Jesus. Uh, Moses saw God's glory on the mountain, but no one's seen the Trinity, that love relationship. And he says, even though no one has seen God in that way, if we love, God abides in us. That is the, that word to dwell with. God has taken up residence within. God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. That's interesting language. And John here is using perfected in a way that we don't commonly use it. Uh, we often use perfection to say with purity or, or without blemish or spot or without inconsistency. But here the word perfected in the original language is telaio, telaio. And it means to carry something to its ultimate end. That there is an ultimate end for which the love of God was intended. We were never created to just receive the love of God and hoard it for ourselves. We aren't called to be cul-de-sacs of the love of God. We're called to be conduits who pass it on to others. And so he says, as we love others, God's love is perfected within us because we're carrying it to its ultimate end. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. His spirit testifies to us that we are his children. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. This is a very um, exclusive verse right there. We have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. John wants it really clear there's only one way to receive the love that our souls crave. It's through Jesus, his son, the father sending his son to be the savior. You can't do enough good stuff and try to stop all the bad stuff for God to uh, forgive you of your sins and deal with that big enemy that you have. There's only one way to God. There's only one way for relationship with him. There's only one way to be brought into this Trinitarian, beautiful love relationship with the God of the universe. And it's through Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. And John wants us to, to see that exclusion that it only comes through Jesus. He goes on, whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. If you confess Christ, Christ dwells within you. And that word confession means that there's a proclamation, but there's also evidence of following Jesus in your life. If you've done that, God abides in you and you will increasingly experience him throughout your life. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. I love John's language there. Uh, he, he, it seems like this has been a process for him. We come to know and believe God's love for us. God is love, again, bringing us back to the nature of God. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Again, that word abide is to dwell, to take up residence within. As we abide in love, we abide in God because God is love. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. This passage, often there's a little chunk of it that's been taken out of context, slapped on bumper stickers and t-shirts and coffee mugs. And I really want to weigh into what this is actually talking about. Because John was on the love train again. He's talking about love and God's love and we should love one another. And now he's talking about fear and punishment and judgment. What's this all about? But often people will take the first part of verse 18 and say, there's no fear in love. I follow Jesus. I shouldn't be afraid of anything. That's not what John's saying here. In fact, God has given us mechanisms to, to fear things that we should actually fear. If a bear is chasing you, I hope you're afraid and not like, well, I follow Jesus, so I'm okay. This is specifically speaking to believers who are in the love of God. And he's saying, look, the day of judgment is coming. And when it comes, you will stand before the Lord in confidence as Jesus is. Because of the work of Jesus, you don't have to fear punishment from the judgment of God because Jesus already took all that punishment for you. And so this isn't just a general say, if you follow Jesus, you'll never fear anything. This is specifically talking about the judgment and punishment of sin and sinners. Okay, so moving on. 
We, ha- we love because he first loved us. Again, he's connecting his- God's love and our love. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, okay? John has a lot of flowery language in his gospel and in this book, but he doesn't beat around the bush here. He says, if you claim to love God, but you hate your brother or sister in Christ, it shows an inconsistency in your life. You're a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot, strong language again, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must, must also love his brother. Church, verse 21 is a commandment for the New Testament church and we are that New Testament church. Let's read that again. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. And the word there in the original language for brother is adelphos, which means brothers and sisters. So I want you to just pause for a minute. Look around the room. Even you who are watching me on video, look around the room. These are your brothers and sisters. These are the people you are called to love. These are the people this commandment applies to. So are you experiencing the love of God and are you extending it? In order for us to to really gain some handlebars on this passage, though, we need a common definition of love, right? People say, I love tacos, and they use the same word for I love my mama, okay? I heard a toddler say, I love blippy, okay? That's not the type of love I'm talking about. I don't love blippy, okay? So when we say love, what in the world are we talking about? We need a common definition of what love is. And every time I I I come to this point, I always think, what is love? Baby, don't hurt me. I know some of you already went there too. But let's come back to the passage to discover what love is. Verse 10, in this is love. Now the word there in the original language is agape. Agape is a love that originates and is sourced in God, is the uh, part of God's nature and character, the essence of who God is, love, agape love, which is a love you and I don't have access to apart from Jesus. We can't drum this stuff up. And then he clarifies that. He says, look, it's not that we love God. We can't agape apart from Jesus. Don't look at yourself. But that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. If we ever doubt God's agape love for us, we only need to look to the cross. This is that space where God loves you unconditionally. So the teaching team kind of worked through uh, an idea of how are we going to define love? If we're going to be talking about love for six weeks, loving each other, experiencing the love of God, loving God, how are we going to define this? And so we define agape love from that passage. And this is in your notes, so I encourage you to write these down. Uh, this is a, there's a couple blanks there, but agape is an unconditional, affectionate desire for someone's best that leads to self-sacrificial action. Unconditional in that there's no strings attached. Affectionate desire in that this comes from the heart of God, not just duty. God's up there like, gosh, I gotta go love those guys again. No, this comes from the source of who he is. He has affections for his people. For someone's best. And we wanted to add more than just that. Because people have all kind of desires that never come to fruition because they never do anything about them. Uh, Think about New Year's resolutions. Got all kinds of desires. Check with me three weeks in. We'll see how much I actually wanted those, right? But an affectionate desire that for someone's best that leads to self-sacrificial action. So let's come back to the passage and see if we see this there. This is love, agape. This is agape. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. That unconditional, affectionate desire from the heart of God. And that encouraged him to do what? Something for our best. Self-sacrificial action. Sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That Jesus Christ, the God man, came here, lived the perfect life you and I could never live. And then at 30 years old, he was beaten, mocked, humiliated, stripped naked, and ultimately crucified. And on the cross, it was not just the physical pain that killed him. There was a spiritual reality that he took your sin and my sin upon himself, absorbing the wrath of God, propitiating it on our behalf. And all we need to do to receive God's love, to, to, uh, experience it, to be forgiven, to have relationship with God is repent of our sin, which just means turning from it, acknowledging it as evil, turning from it and 
placing our faith in, in Jesus and in Jesus alone. And so the love of God, again, an unconditional, affectionate desire for someone's best that leads to self-sacrificial action. But the problem is the narrative of what love is that we hear from the world, from movies, from TV, from music, from all over the place, from our home of origin maybe even, is not always agape. And so we have a narrative that has been written for us that if we're going to be people of agape community, if we're going to be people who experience God's love and extend it, we need to be people who rewrite the story of what love is. And as we were kind of doing some work on this, Shauna Murphy, who's the renewal director, she's also over women's ministry. She's been on the teaching team for a long time and uh, she's a great contributor. She was contributing to this, this uh, message And she went on Google and typed in, we just wanted to get an idea of, we know what agape is, but what does the world think love is? And so she went on Google and started doing some work and Google AI came back with a definition of love for us. Now think about AI. AI sums up all of what humanity believes on a subject and puts it in a succinct document for you to read. Here's what Google AI says. Worldly love, a type of love that is based on oneself, one's desires, In one's condition. A type of love, this is the type of love that says, I love you until. I love you if you do this. I love you when this. I love you until there's something that I like more that comes along and then I'm going to leave you. That's not love. That's using people to get your needs met in unhealthy ways. And this is the narrative of love that is promulgated all over the place in our world. And we're going to have to rewrite that narrative. And how do we do that? We do that by experiencing God's love, experiencing God's love. Let's look at it again in the passage. He says, beloved, he wants us to be sure of our identity. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. That word for know in the original language is gnosko. Gnosko. And gnosko isn't just knowing by analysis and study. It's an experiential and relational intimacy knowledge. It's something that you experience. It's the same word that's used of marital intimacy, of marital relationships. And so the, uh, the idea here is that we're to know God by experience. And I, I started asking some, some colleagues and just some Christians that I trust that are mature. I, I admire their walk in Jesus. How do you experience the love of God? And I was really surprised. Many people couldn't answer that question. They could tell me how they see God extending love through them. But just simply for them to say, here's how I experience God's love, it was really difficult for them to answer that question. So I start thinking, am I off on some wackadoo theology that isn't biblical? And as I was praying through that and wrestling through that, talking to uh, my teaching team about that, I came to a passage the Lord led me to, Ephesians chapter 3. And he says here, uh, Paul writing to a different church, but the same idea. He says, I pray, verse 18, that they may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The word there in the original language for know is gnosko. So our last passage says we're to gnosko God, we're to know God through experiential relationship. But this passage clearly says we're to know God's love through gnosko, through experiential relational intimacy with God. And so God's love is something to be experienced, not just studied and analyzed. And so the question I want to ask you is, are you experiencing the love of God? Is it something that you, you've you experienced throughout your Christian walk? Is it something you live in and day in and day out? Or have you relegated yourself to a space that says, God can't love me because I messed up here or, or look at my past? Or maybe you're on the other side of the fence and you think, I don't really need God's love. I'm pretty good on my own. Are you experiencing the love of God? If you're in Christ, you are the beloved. Are you experiencing the ramifications of that reality? And I wanted to kind of give us a few practical ideas on how, if we have no idea how to experience the the love of God, I wanted to give us just a few practical ideas on how to begin, okay? Because this is a big concept. And again, a, a disciple is somebody who increasingly experiences the love of God. That means it takes time to actually grow this in our lives. And so I wanted to give us a few practical ideas here. Firstly, reflect on the cross. The cross 
is the definitive statement about his love for you. It's the definitive statement about his love for you. So reflect on the cross. This is the point of communion to remember. Jesus says, remember what I've done for you. Remember the weight of your sin and that you were a slave to it. And yet you've been set free. No chains, no shackles, no cage. You're free and forgiven. You are loved. The second thing is to be in Christian community. Some of the places I've experienced the love of God the most is in Christian community. And so I want to challenge you. Are you in Christian community? And I also want to put a caveat here. I know in Christian community, you can experience agape love. And I know you can experience the opposite of that. If you've been in the church any amount of time, you've probably been hurt by the church. And as I say, be in Christian community, some of us in the room are like, no way. I've been there before. I got backstabbed. I got gossiped about. It hurt. I'm not re-entering. And I, and I would say to you, maybe you're not ready to jump into a life group or a discipleship group or a Bible study or a community with other believers right now, but you can't stay where you're at. Those wounds will only fester. And so who, who can you bring in to that space with you to help you process those wounds? Who can you onboard into that journey with you Uh, a therapist, a counselor, a trusted friend, somebody that you can let into that space that healing might come, that you can eventually re-enter into Christian community so that you can experience levels of agape love that God has for you there. And lastly, have rhythms of relationship with God. Have rhythms of relationship with him. If you're not in relationship with the God who's showering you with love, you're probably not gonna recognize his love in your life. Just like if I'm not in rhythms of relationship with my wife, she's probably not gonna experience my love and I'm probably not gonna experience hers as well. And so these three practical things, I want you to try to implement them this week. Which one do you need? Reflect on the cross, be in Christian community, or have rhythms of relationship with him. I'm actually going to have uh, our life groups director, Heather Jones, join us up here on the stage. Uh, this whole series was kind of her baby. Um, she came to us earlier this year as a teaching team and said, this is something for us to go through during this season. So Heather, Hi. Good to see you. So thanks for joining me up here. I was a little bit lonely. Um, <laughs> but so as we talk about experiencing the love of God and, and, and ultimately desiring to extend that into our sphere of influence, how do you experience the love of God? So that was a really good question. How do I experience God's love? And when you first asked, I was like, oh, that's a really good question. I don't really actually know the answer to that. And so I, I started noodling on it, as you would say. And as I, as I was, I realized I, I experience God's love kind of in my love languages, which are acts of service and gifts. And, and so I, I too receive the gift, the, the gift of God's love through his people who just see me when I need to be seen and pray for me and all of those wonderful things. And then I also receive it in the gifts that God gives. And, and I see those as like the little things where God does something that's functional, but he's so extra with it. And, and I, I personally love a rainy day. I know a number of you are mourning because it's fall and um, you are mourning summer and I mourn with you because the Bible tells me to. But at the end of the day, I love a rainy day and I, I love the way that rain smells and I love the way it sounds when it hits the window or the roof or, or the leaves and the grass around me and I love the way a rainy day feels and I know the functionality of rain. I know that rain waters things and fills our streams and rivers and puts out fires. All of the good things that rain does and God could have stopped there but because he loves us and he wants us to experience that love, he just goes so above and beyond so that we can enjoy these things too. And so, so for me, I, I feel loved on a rainy day, but I also experience God's love as something deeper and, and more sure. It's this deep sense of security that I have in God's love because, because his love is sure and it's constant and it's immeasurable and it's immovable and, and I can't control it and I can't chase it away and I can't mess it up. And, and at the end of the day, it's in and through me and, and other people's love will shift and change and they'll love you today and hate you tomorrow. And, and, and I don't have to worry so much about that. It it frees me up to love others because I'm anchored in this love that is God's, that is so sure and so secure. 
Yeah, I love that security and safety there. It, I mean, because it reminds me of what I was talking about earlier, just that the cross is God's definitive statement of his love for you, that it's unchanging. Jesus has finished the work, and right. therefore we can rest in the security and safety of his love. Right. And so, so, Heather, we're talking through this series for six weeks. We're looking at how we experience God's love and how we extend God's love to others. Why this series and why this season? Yeah, I, uh, I think it's no secret that the last four years have been tumultuous. It's been hard. And it doesn't seem like that general feeling of tumult and discord is going away. It just feels like it's rising. Like some days you're just driving and you just feel the anger and the hatred and the discord. And we're, we're in the middle of a hard season. We're, and then we've got elections coming up and I'm looking at the horizon. It doesn't seem to be getting any nicer out there. And, and I just feel myself resonating on Jesus's words that the love of many will grow cold. And, and so I, I think to myself, if there's one place I should be able to find peace and an accordance, it would be in the church and with God's people. And yet, I think in these four years, I've watched brothers and sisters in Christ be torn apart and to tear each other apart. And it's broken my heart so much. And it's even multiplied by the fact that I know we should be different. The scripture tells us we should look different. And so about three years ago, we did a series on community, and we were in Ben Connolly's book. Um, a Field Guide for Genuine Community. That's the one, yes. I remembered it. Thank you so much. A Field Guide for Genuine Community. If you haven't read it, definitely check it out. But he talks about these hundred verses that are in the New Testament, from Jesus to the apostles to the, to the early church pastors that addressed and instructed the church on how we were to be in community together, how we were to interact with one another in committed relationship. And it makes so much sense to me as I was compiling this list that they would have this kind of instruction because the church was built in a tumultuous time. It was filled with all these like freshly uh, faithed people. They were coming to Jesus, coming to relationship with him, coming into the church, and they were coming with their own culture, their own assumptions, their own norms, and having to interact with one another. But as I was looking through this really beautiful list of the ways that we're supposed to interact with each other, it felt like a little bit it could come off like a finger wagging good time. Mm. Like we would be telling you to just try harder. And if we tried harder long enough, hard enough, then maybe we could eke out this picture of what God told us the church was supposed to look like. And that just didn't feel right to the team, to myself. And so we put a pause on one anothering and we decided to focus on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Um, to make sure that we got what the early burgeoning church knew, that we knew that it was, we couldn't do this by ourselves, that this was a work of the Holy Spirit through us, that we have to be empowered to extend that kind of agape love. Yeah, I love that. And you referencing the early church and just the cultural baggage everybody brought to the table as their baby Christians, right? Think about, think about Jesus' disciples, right? You got 12 guys together who don't always agree. You got a zealot who wants to forcibly overthrow the Roman oppressors, and you have a tax collector who works for them. And yet God brought these people together in the foundation of a loving community. If there's hope for them, there's certainly hope for us. As we experience God's love, we can then extend it to one another, despite the differences you were talking about. And so I want to move in uh, to the next portion of our passage and uh, on extending God's love. Ultimately, we're not called to just be cul-de-sacs, but we're called to be conduits, people who carry God's love into every sphere of this broken world. And look at the passage again. It says, verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. He reminds us, beloved, you are beloved. And because of that, because you're the recipient of God's love, you are to love one another. That's what this whole series is, is centered around, the idea of what does love really look like in the church? And then a few verses later, in verse 20, John really doubles down on this idea. He says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. Strong language, right? For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And I don't think John is saying they're intentionally lying, say, I love God, but not these people. I don't think, I, I don't think he, he's saying that they're intentionally lying, but it's a diagnostic question for you. If you say you love God, but you hate his church, there's a big question whether or not you truly love the God of the Bible. 
Okay? And so, he, and then he closes with this command. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. So, Heather, as we talk about experiencing the love of God, and then now as we've experienced it and received it, extending it to the world around us, uh, to our brothers and sisters, what can this command look like in the church today? Yeah. I love that you call it a command. I, I remember when we were first talking about it, and you said, in 11, it's like a suggestion, but at the back half of this <laughs> verse, it's like, it's a command. This is what we are to do. Yeah. And I think the first thing that that just really puts in the room for me is, is that I can't just look at other people and see them as the problem. And that's usually the way I go about it. I, I think it would be easy to love if there weren't other people. But there are other people. And so I do feel like this says I am part of the problem, but I'm also part of the solution. Mm. I think um, being loved and abiding and knowing God's Love means extending that love to others. It means being a conduit, like you said, more of a hose than a bucket, uh, more or less of a cul-de-sac. And, and um, it means we are to live into our beloved identity, receiving God and loving one another. And a community that is characterized by that agape love looks like a community that is clearly marked by the fruit of the Spirit. It's a community characterized by peace with one another. It's a community so marked by humility that we can instruct one another. It's a community where it's safe to confess our sins to one another. It's a community where we carry one another's burdens and where we submit to one another. And it looks like all of that, even in our differences, not without them, but even in them. And if you think about it, that kind of community you can't find anywhere else. You look in the world and it, it just doesn't exist and the world is looking for it too. Our hope is theirs. Yeah, and that's a high call. I mean, and we can only do this as we experience the love of God. We are hopeless to extend agape love if we're not receiving it from the source of love. And so we want to challenge us throughout this series to grow in agape community, to grow as people who love each other well. And so uh, we're going to release to the campuses and let you guys wrestle with a couple questions. Love you guys. Thank you so much for sticking around, guys. It's a joy to be here with you today. And I just want to, I just want to challenge our hearts a little bit. As we've heard from God's word that we're supposed to be experiencing his love. I, I want you to reflect on this in your, in your homes with your spouse or your kids or your parents or, or a trusted friend. Don't just let this question just fly by today. Actually reflect on it. How do you experience God's love? How have you experienced it? through his community, through his word, through prayer, through circumstances in your life. How have you experienced God's love? If we want to be people who extend it, we first need to be people who are experiencing it. And then secondly, how do you extend God's love? In, in the community you're in, to your brothers and sisters in Christ, how are you extending God's love? Are you extending God's love? Or has some bitterness and resentment begun to creep in and inhibit your ability to do so? I challenge you again, talk about this with a trusted friend, a spouse, a parent, somebody who can help you wrestle through these ideas. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you that you are a good God who loves us. In fact, that you are love. I pray for the conversations that are going to happen as a result of the teaching today, that you would give us gracious curiosity on these questions, that we wouldn't shame ourselves, but we would be graciously curious with you and uh, in your presence on these questions. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys again for hanging out with us. Love you.